When I was in college, I worked for a company called FYE, For Your Entertainment. It's a CD, DVD store that is in shopping malls across the country. It still exists. People still go to CD stores. How about that? Uh, and, and so what I did there during the summer was that I worked for their events side of things. So I worked in the store during school. During the summer, I worked events. And what that looked like was I would go to concerts, set up a table. We'd have our little booth, set up a table, lay out the CDs. I'd sell CDs for the artist that was performing. And then we'd bring them back to the table to do a signing for the people who had bought CDs after the show. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. And so what that looked like, I was actually one of the managers for events. Very, very impressive, I'm sure. Uh, and so I would go into the store and I would get the product, the CDs were selling, I would get a sheet of paper that had, you know, all the information, and then it would have, like, the manager's name and number on it, like the band's manager. Um, so whatever guy or gal was, you know, wrangling those cats, like, I would talk to that person. And I remember one time, I did a signing for Hanson, like, the Mbop kids, right? But at this point, they were not the Umbop kids because they were like 27 and like had families. It was kind of strange. Uh, and I go in and I get the sheet of paper and it says, uh, you know, it's got the info. And then where their manager's, tour manager's name, usually it says machine and then has a number. So I'm talking to the manager in the store like, so is this like a voicemail box I'm calling or what's happening here? And he goes, no, I think the guy's name is machine. And so I get to the amphitheater and I have to call a number and go, is Machine there? <laughs> to which I hear, yeah, this is Machine. I was like, all right. <laughs> and so I, uh, I meet this guy. Now, I don't know what you would think of when you picture a guy named Machine. It's probably not what I got. I meet this guy who is like 45, wearing slacks and a polo, and has like his Bluetooth earpiece in, not talking to someone, but you gotta be ready, right? Uh, when you're managing Hanson, these things are important. <laughs> just like, I don't know what I was picturing from a man named Machine, but it was not this guy. But, and so what I would do is I would talk to these guys, in this case, Mr. Machine, this is the first name, is the last, I got so many questions. And I'd work out, okay, this is how this will work. The band will come in this way. So this is, you know, the one venue that I did most of these at is an outdoor venue. So there's a lot of space. They could walk off stage and then around this thing. They can sneak in the back door of our tent and we'll let them in and they can sit down. We'll sign. We're talking wristbands, how people are getting in, working out all these details so that all the band has to do, play their set, come back, sit down, sign things, walk away. So they're freed up to do the thing that they need to do. My job was pave the way, make it easy and simple for them. In the case of the Hansen kids, that meant a metal barricade that girls handed things over lest they be trampled by preteens. And so, and so the job was set the stage, set the table, get everything ready for them so they could do what they had to do. That's kind of what John the Baptist does for Jesus. His role is he comes before Jesus and he sort of sets the stage. He sets the tone. He prepares people to hear what Jesus is going to say. He prepares people to, to witness all they're going to witness in the life of Jesus. He sets them up. It's like you know, playing volleyball, right? You bump it, or you set it up to someone on your side of the net, and so they can go over and spike it down. What John does here for Jesus, he prepares the way. And so we're going to pick up our story in Matthew here this weekend with a little quick two-parter called Going Public, sort of a double entendre, because baptism is about going public with your faith, and it's the first time you see Jesus. And so here we go. We're going to learn about the origin of baptism, where it comes from, what it's all about. And then I think that leads nicely into a little baptism service that we're doing April 17th. There's a method to the madness. We think about these things. 
And so if you got a Bible, Matthew chapter 3, this is what he writes. It says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now, John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not presume to say for yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear the threshing floor and gather his weed into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So first of all, who was John the Baptist? Who is this guy? Well, we learn in one of the other Gospels that he's actually Jesus' cousin. All of the Gospels talk about John the Baptist. Every single one says basically the same things about who he is and what he does. And in Luke, we find out they're cousins. Luke writes that Mary has a relative named Elizabeth, and Mary and Elizabeth are pregnant at the same time. Both surprising pregnancies. Mary's maybe a little more so. Uh, <laughs> But they're pregnant together. Elizabeth is pregnant with John and Mary is pregnant, of course, with Jesus. Now, when we see here that, Jesus, or that John's lifestyle, it's as simple as it can possibly get. What does he wear? Well, he wears camel hair clothes. He's got a dried skin belt. It's got to be itchy, right? I'm thinking, I've never worn camel hair, but I've got to think it's a little scratchy. Back then, everybody wore fabrics. They wore cottons, linens, things like that. The richer you were, the better fabrics you could buy. If you've seen any movie set in like Roman times or anything, they get it pretty right clothing-wise. John goes out, and he doesn't choose cotton. or He goes with camel hair. Kind of a strange choice. Until you realize that John's seen as this type of Elijah, that it says in Malachi that before the day of the Lord, Elijah's coming back. Who's Eli well, Elijah was this prophet in the Old Testament. He's one of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament. And he doesn't actually die. He gets like swept up into heaven by this chariot of fire. Sort of this crazy scene that happens then. And Malachi says, well, he's actually coming back before this whole thing wraps up, before the day of the Lord, the end times. And what we see with John the Baptist is that he is this Elijah type. It's not literally Elijah, but he's the Elijah that's come to sort of announce that Jesus is on the way. And what did Elijah wear? Camel hair, leather belt. And so John goes out and sort of, not only is he filling this role of Elijah, he even looks the part. Dress for the job you want, I suppose. Like He goes out and looks just like him to awaken those mental images for everybody. His diet's a bit peculiar, you could say. He's eating locusts and wild honey. There's only one benefit to that. So you can forage for it pretty easy. Locusts are everywhere. Pick them up, go to town. Simple. He eats honey, but it's wild honey. He's not going to a beekeeper or something, getting a jar. He's just whatever honey he finds, he'll eat. It's like Winnie the Pooh style, right? And so he's got sort of this strange diet, and the whole thing is that it's simple. He's not spending a lot of time on food. He's not spending a lot of money on food. It's just whatever he needs to power him to do this job, 
that's the bare, that's all he's interested in. He's doing the bare minimum food wise. John and I, very, very different <laughs> in this respect. He's the first freegan, you could say, like he's just eating what he finds. Now, later, Jesus is going to tell people, don't worry about what you wear, don't worry about what you eat. John the Baptist sets the all time high scorer for this. Like, no one is ever going to do it as well as he does. And now, at this point in time when he shows up, we're in the middle of what came to be known as the silent years. Malachi's written about 400 years or so before Jesus is born. And in those 400 years, it's thought that God is silent. He's not speaking anymore. There are no more prophets. There are no more scriptures being written. There's nothing. It's just silence. And so John shows up in the middle of this. We haven't had prophets since my, uh, Malachi. We haven't, we haven't had these things. And now here's a guy who's dressed like Elijah, He's proclaiming this message. He's doing it in the wilderness, which is where prophets always start in the Old Testament. All of these things are lining up. People want to know what's going on here. And so what was his message? What was this thing that he's saying? Well, the first thing he tells everyone to do is repent. Now, the Greek word that he uses here, the Greeks had this idea of repentance, but it really just meant changing your mind. And so it wasn't necessarily about this life change that was a good thing. It was just changing your mind about something, going from one position to another. You could repent from a bad position to a good position. You could repent from a good position to a bad position. They really didn't make any distinctions. But the Jews saw repentance a little bit differently. For them, repentance involved this turning around. That's what the Hebrew word that this translates sort of has in mind this changing of directions. It wasn't just about making a mental change and going, yeah, I think this thing's true. There was this life change that accompanied that, and it's always from bad to good. It's always a positive thing. And you notice that John doesn't just say repent, but then he also tells them, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. So it's not just changing your mind, it's also you should be acting in a way that shows the mental change that's gone on up here. It's not enough to just have a belief. You have to do something about it. Now, wrapped up in all of this, of course, is the admission that you are wrong. Like, in order for you to change your belief or change your life, to make a drastic change like this, it has to come after you saying, you know what? This isn't working. I've got to try something new. I'm wrong. I've made a mistake becoming more and more rare these days to hear people actually own up to mistakes. Public officials often the common refrain is, well, mistakes were made, which the underlying unsaid thing there between the lines is, but not by me, of course. (laughs) Uh, In my beloved mixed martial arts, there's uh, plenty of bad judges and referees that still have jobs because firing them would mean admitting that hiring them or not firing them for the first 100 terrible mistakes uh, was a problem, that they screwed up by not doing that, and so, well, we can't fire them now because then we look bad. And so John's message is repent, which means you have to own up to your mistakes. You have to own up to your flaws, your limitations. You have to own up to your failure. Matthew Henry writes, you know, a pretty popular, famous commentary about the Bible, and he had said that, you know, the Jews had been taught to justify themselves, but here comes John the Baptist, and he flips it and teaches them instead to accuse themselves. It's twofold, repentance. It's change your mind, change your life. Both of those things have to happen for repentance. As uh, Joachim Nilka Calls it. He says, repentance is the radical recognition of God. Change your mind, change your life. And why are they supposed to repent? He tells them because the kingdom of heaven is near. When he says that, he means it's coming. It's right around the corner. Any day now. It's happening Tuesday or sometime shortly after. Like It's close. And the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, it's not about an area. It's not, about a, it's not a place. 
It can't be drawn on a map. It's not like you think kingdom, like the Lion King, right? Or Mufasa, everything the light touches is our kingdom, right? It's like it's talking about place. That's not the way that this is meant. The kingdom of God is God's active rule. It's not a place, it's something that he does. He rules, and that's his kingdom. And so John's saying this reign, this rule of God, it's coming soon. Because of that, you better repent, clean yourself up. Jesus is coming. And then the signifier of that repentance is baptism. Now this is interesting because baptism's not in the Old Testament at all. And here comes John and he just says, yeah, and then be baptized. And everyone just goes, okay, yeah, sure, let's be baptized. Like, where does this come from? Is he just making this up? What, where is this? Well, the origin of it is the ceremonial washing that they used to have to do. Old Testament law, purity is very important, uh, even down to hygienic sorts of things that they had to do that were part of their ritual, part of their ceremony. There's hand washing, there's foot washing, there's all kinds of ritual washing. None of them involved whole body dunking and submerging. They added that a little bit later. That gets added in that silent era where Gentiles are converting to Judaism. They're saying, we believe in your God. We want to leave paganism. We want to come to Judaism. And to make sure that they were ceremonially clean, the Jews would baptize them, which meant dunk them. Like, all right, we're not... A little hand washing is not going to do. We've got to bathe you before we get you ready for church. That's basically what's happening here. So rather than risk the, the, that someone is unclean and they go into the temple, they're like, all right, we're going to baptize you. And they would have people sort of baptize themselves. They didn't do Now we think of baptism. It's a pastor, an elder, someone that sort of takes you down, pulls you back up. For them, it was just like, all right, you go dip yourself a few times. We'll watch. It was kind of the way that it worked. And so when John comes and he says, all right, look, you guys need to repent because this reign, this rule of God, it's coming, it's coming soon. You need to do that and you need to be baptized. It's kind of a slap in the face because here's this thing that they're doing for Gentiles, for all of us. They're saying, look, you guys are unclean because of that. We're going to need to wash you up. And now John takes this thing that they're doing for Gentiles and he flips it and goes, yeah, you guys, you need to clean up. Two, you need to be washed. You need to be baptized. And this word baptism has some force to it. It doesn't just mean dip. It's not like this light thing. It sort of means this like forceful submerging. It's said of people that have drowned that they were baptized. Uh, when a city or a building is just chock full of people, and you say people flooded the temple, the word they used is they baptized the temple. There's this force to it, which leads Frederick Brunner to say that baptism is a kind of drowning and cleansing all at once, which says in so many words, die, sin. And so John's message then is basically, look, y'all need to get your act together before the Lord comes, because he's coming, and you need to shape up. It's not going to be sunshine and lollipops. He's coming to just burn this forest to the ground. He tells the leaders, look, the axe is at the root. Now, I've never cut a tree down. But I do know that you don't start at the root. You start a little bit up. You cut and you make a stump, right? Eventually, you pull the stump or grind it down or whatever you're going to do. But you don't start at the root. It's kind of weird to put the axe at the root. How do you even do that? But what John's saying is this is how thorough this cleansing is going to be. He's coming... And this is how deep the judgment goes. He's not just cutting the trees down and leaving stumps. He's taking them out by the root. Trees. He's cutting them down and he's burning everything. The Lord is coming and he's bringing wrath with him. Now God's wrath, what that is ultimately, it's where his love collides with injustice. It's where his grace smashes into our selfishness. See, God can't harbor sin. He's perfect, and his perfect nature can't abide it. 
And so he has to do something about it. His response is wrath. And ultimately, his wrath is good. It is good for us that wrath is part of God's character. Because think about the alternative. Like We get mad when bad things happen. You hear about something on the news, some killing or shooting or something some terrible event, we get upset about it. We hear about, well, this human trafficking ring was broken up or whatever. You get mad about those things. And imagine serving a God that sees those things and just eh, doesn't really care. No, he sees that sin and it makes him mad too. And the expression of that is his wrath. We chafe at the wrath thing a bit because then when it turns around to our sin... It's like, well, you got to understand, there's a lot of mitigating factors here, right? It's not so bad. We downplay the seriousness of our sin. And part of that is we grow up in a culture where, okay, like if you murder someone, that's real bad. You do this much jail time. You steal a Twinkie, like you get this much probation or whatever. And so we have this scale of how bad things are. But spiritually, to God, they're all the same. Sin is just sin. Our sins, in fact, are that bad. And so we've got to get used to not pointing the finger at everybody else, but accusing ourselves, like Matthew Henry said. Looking at our sin and realizing the depth of it, the badness of it. It's really easy for us to be real judgmental of people that sin differently than we do. And what this is showing us is no, all of us, no matter what your sin habits may be, they are all bad enough to warrant this. And so John is right in his prophecies here. Because in actually next week we will see Jesus. He shows up. No longer little baby Jesus. Now he's grown bearded Jesus. But it is a little bit different than John anticipates. Because John anticipates, he's coming, he's burning everything. And that's not what Jesus does. Instead, what would we see Jesus do? He comes and he lives sinless life. He dies for us. He rises from the dead. And in that, makes a way for us. But then Jesus himself says, I'm leaving, but I'm coming back. And when I do, yeah, it's going to be a whole lot like what John was talking about. He preaches many of the same things that John the Baptist does. And so, how do people respond to John? Here's this guy, it's a pretty tough message. Accuse yourself, realize how sinful you are, get cleaned up because the Lord's coming. How do they respond to that? Well, the general population, they're into it. We see people flock to him all around the surrounding geographic area. They're all pouring out to the Jordan River to watch this guy, to be baptized, to hear what he has to say. I think the thing is, these people, they understand they're not getting it right all the time. They understand like, well, yeah, I do have a lot of sin. Man, Day of Atonement, my list is a whole lot longer than everybody else's. There's a lot of sacrifices I'm paying for because I, I just I can't do this myself. I'm screwing up. I need this thing he's talking about. I need this cleansing. They admit that they need help, and they're willing to seek it out. And so the people love John the Baptist. Josephus is this historian that writes about the events that happened back then. And he talks about how people loved him. And Herod Antipas has him killed at one point. Spoilers for our Matthew reading. Uh, Herod Antipas has him killed, and the people are furious about it. And as a matter of fact, a little while after this, Herod loses a big military battle. And Josephus records that all of the people, all of the Jews, have been saying, well, the reason he lost that battle is because God is angry at him for killing John the Baptist. They love this guy. The religious leaders, on the other hand, they're not so hot on John. We see here the Pharisees and the Sadducees for the first time, sort of introduced to all of these groups of people. They're checking this thing out, want to see what's going on, why are all these people coming out here. 
and they're not big supporters. And I think the reason is that they're self-secure. What they're doing is working for them, they think. So we don't need this guy. We don't need what he's selling, but let's go see what's happening here. And so John does something shocking when they come out to see him. He doesn't greet them and, hey, good morning, thanks for coming, brother. He goes, you bunch of snakes. <laughs> Who told you to get out of your rock and come slither on over here? John, let's calm it down a little bit here. Now, I've heard people say, like, you know, well, I don't have to be nice to all the people. Look at John the Baptist. It's like, okay, pause. Like, John the Baptist is not a great role model, okay? <laughs> if you're going to say, like, well, John the Baptist talked bad to people, you best be eating locusts and honey. I'm going to be checking. <laughs> but here's the thing is that, like, if you think about it, there, I'm doing all this research for this message and reading what different people have to say about John the Baptist, and there's this one professor that's writing and is talking how he quizzes his students, who's the greatest prophet of the Old Testament? And so, of course, people are like, it's Isaiah, or it's Elijah, or it's Ezekiel, and throwing out these names. And the answer that he's looking for is John the Baptist. Like, John the Baptist is in the New Testament. But this is before Jesus at the Last Supper says, this is the new covenant in my blood. What's testament mean? Well, it's covenant. So the old covenant, John the Baptist is the last Old Testament prophet. So he's not a great role model. There's a lot of things the Old Testament prophets do that I would not recommend. Like, I'm not going to suggest, you know, all the single dudes in here be like, you know, Hosea, go marry a uh, prostitute. Like, no, it's not what you should do. So John's unique. His position's unique. Let him be him. You're not John the Baptist. Be nice to people. That's the point. <laughs> what I think's important, though, is that, like, it's really easy to read Pharisees and Sadducees, and we see, like, oh, the villains. They're the bad guys. Look how foolish they are. How do they miss this? But I think we miss a lot of what Matthew has to say to us if we don't look at Pharisee and Sadducee and in our minds replace that with us. We don't see ourselves here. They reject repentance. They reject this message because they don't think they need it. And honestly, we do the same thing. We're liable to, for the same reasons, reject repentance because we don't think we need it. There's three reasons here, I see, that people reject repentance. First is that what the Pharisees do, the fact that they're named here, it shows us something. So that, like the Pharisees were a religious party that called themselves the separated. I mean, is that not like the most smug thing? About? We are the separated, which means that you peons are the people we are separated from, right? And so they've got this big sense of self-righteousness that they're bringing with them. But what they did was they placed an extremely high value on the law. These guys were into the Bible. They knew it front to back, literally. Had the entire Old Testament memorized, could recall it like that. Knew everything about it. They're really focused on Scripture. And they were really focused on the law, specifically. They weren't going to break a single command. It doesn't mean they were perfect, because the law... Okay, if you sin, then you do this for the forgiveness of that sin and so on. So they do all of that. They keep the law perfectly. And not only that, because we read the Old Testament law, we look at that and we're like, I don't know how people ever did this. They go a step beyond that. Because then there's this book that's the oral tradition. It's the teaching of all of these rabbis and teachers throughout history that have looked at the law and reflected on it. And they take that like, let's hold all of this up, too. Let's do all of this. They add more law to the law. And a lot of it is things to make sure that they never break the law. So it says, you can't walk a mile on the Sabbath. So now, new rule. You can't walk a half mile on the Sabbath. Why? Because if you happen to slip up, you walk 0.53 miles. You're still so far away from actually violating the law. So they took the law of God seriously. They were into it. They were all about it. But they would focus on the specifics to 
an unhealthy degree. They get bogged down in minutia. That they're so narrowly focused on these commands, they're missing everything around them. They're, they're all about the law, but they're completely missing the God who gave it to them. All about the Scripture. They're completely forgetting to love their neighbors around them. This isn't a problem that just existed back then and now it's not around anymore. We're liable to do the same thing. I myself, personally, am susceptible to this, 100%. It is easy for me to get overly focused on doctrine and miss some of the bigger pictures. I know that. It's easier for me to get wrapped up in little things and give them a little more time and attention than I probably should. I'll own that. We can be so serious about our Bible study that it leads us away from the God that gave it to us. After all, it's not the Father, Son, and the Holy Scripture. Right? And so it's possible for us to go too far in that direction, to be so focused on the details that we miss the big picture. That's what the Pharisees do, and I think that's something we do sometimes too. Now the Sadducees, they go in the other direction. We don't know as much about them because they don't get written about as much. They sort of purposefully stay out of a lot of the arguments and things like that. They don't challenge Jesus like the Pharisees do. Pharisees, good arguers. They know the law, and they're all about that. They're lawyers, basically, right? You know? And so they know how to argue. The Sadducees, they're a little more like, hey, let's, let's just stay out of this. See, uh, we do know that one of their beliefs, they didn't believe in the resurrection in the last days. Old Testament sort of taught that at the end of the world, everyone is resurrected and judged. And the lion lays down with the lamb. We turn swords into plowshares because there's no more war or anything. And so in all of that language, the Sadducees didn't seem to hold that that was a real, a real event that was ever going to happen. You can remember this by their name, right? They were sad, you see, because they didn't believe in the resurrection, right? I got Bible jokes, yeah. <laughs> Instead of focusing too much on the law, what the Sadducees would do is they focus too much on the world around them. There's a group of people that, they're, they're Jewish t- teachers, but they're cooperating with the Romans to make sure that things go well for them. They're distancing themselves from any uprisings. Any, anyone starts talking out of line, and they're not having anything to do with that. Probably why you don't see him around Jesus too much, because he starts stirring things up, and they go, well, let's just forget about that fellow. They were made up of the upper class. They were very wealthy. This is an aristocratic movement, the Sadducees. They went the other way. Instead of being hyper-focused on Scripture, they get hyper-focused on the here and now. Today, this happens too. This might look today like a Christian who's really into social justice, is really into missions, not so much into making sure that we like treat the Bible properly or get Jesus or doctrine right. It's an error in the other direction. And now none of us get to say, well, I'm really glad that I just straddle those two lines perfectly. right? Because if we're all honest, there's probably one of those sides that we're more liable to fall to. Or maybe you're like me, where depending on which way the wind's blowing, you might go off either direction, right? Because I'll do both of these things. We all lean too far sometimes. It said there's this old phrase, you know, you're so heavenly minded that you're of no earthly good. And that was sort of true of the Pharisees. That You could probably say that about them. Sadducees, sort of the other direction. They were so earthly minded, they were of no heavenly good. So we're all liable to go either direction there. We care too much about doctrine and forget people, or we care too much about people and we forget doctrine. They're both important. We've got to walk that line. What is important is that regardless, no matter which way you go, so when we read Pharisees, when we read Sadducees, we've got to make sure that we're replacing that with us. We're seeing ourselves there. There is a reason that they had in common that they rejected what John had to say. And that was their heritage. Their sons of Abraham as good Jews. Well, we're the people of God. We're chosen. We have our security. We don't need anything else. We're sons of Abraham. And John's got to wake him up. Look at the rocks, man. God can make new sons for Abraham out of the rocks. He don't need you. 
Don't think for a second you're exempt from this. No one is. We can't depend on anyone else's faith. Well, my parents are Christian, so I guess I'm a Christian too. It's not how it works. Family trees don't matter. Jesus is just looking for trees that bear fruit. So we can't hold up family heritage. We can't hold up church heritage. Well, thank God that we're Baptist or we're Catholic or Presbyterian or Reformed or whatever it might be. It doesn't matter. The only thing that matters, did you repent, did you bear fruit? That's it. So you might be thinking, like, well, Jeremy, that sounds a whole lot like law and not gospel. Well, and that's true. This is why John the Baptist isn't Jesus. He's the place setter for Jesus. See, you need the law before the gospel. So the law serves a purpose. If you take the law out and you just go straight to the gospel, you're not getting the setup. You're not getting that plate, so that road that's smoothed out to let the message come. You miss it. See, the gospel isn't just Jesus loves you. The gospel is you are in desperate need of a Savior because you have not been able, no one has been able to uphold this standard. But Jesus loved you so much that he comes, he lives the sinless life that you couldn't. He dies in your place where you should have, but he takes it instead. And then he rises from the dead so that when you accept this gift, he gives you his righteousness, his purity that we couldn't earn on our own. Paul tells us in Romans that the law, through the law, comes the knowledge of sin. So that we look at the law and we go, I don't measure up. This is why it's still important for Christians to read the Old Testament law, to go through Leviticus and Deuteronomy. I know sometimes they're like, man, this is boring. But you read it and you see like how far short I come to the standard God has set. Like, man, I don't, I'm not there. And you've got to first see how far you fall short before you start looking at what Jesus has to offer. Because otherwise, grace is cheap. Otherwise, he's not really doing much. I need a Savior because I fall so short. I'm helpless. I'm doomed. Period. This isn't rhetorical. This is, I'm saying me, I, Jeremy, I fall incredibly short. I need a Savior. And so I need to repent, I need to confess, I need to bear fruit. And the gospel says that I do those things, and it's still not enough. But Jesus picks up the tab, and he covers it. And so in response to that, to honor him and to honor this gift, I still confess and repent and bear fruit. What we see here is this baptism, it's the physical sign of this inward thing that God is doing. That's what baptism is. It's an outward sign of something that's taking place on the inside. But first, we repent. We confess our sin to God. We don't deny it. We don't make excuses. We don't try to explain it away. We own it. Bruner says, sin is remitted where sin is admitted. No less than that. So we repent. We confess. And then we bear Fruits. I'm not talking about fruits of the Spirit. That's a different thing. I'm talking about we honor the law of Christ and live by it. We show Jesus that we love him by obeying his commands. How do I know that? That's what Jesus said. If we don't have any desire to do that, hear me, we're not saved. Like, catch this. If if you're not earnestly trying to live by the commands of Jesus, if you are not compelled to live up to his standard as best you can, if you are not saddened and sickened by your own sin and work to put it to death, those are all signs that you are not a Christian. I do you no favors by not being clear here. I hear people answer the question, are you a Christian? They go, yeah, I believe in God. We read James last summer. James was Jesus' brother, who, while Jesus is doing his miracles and teaching, not a big fan. Jesus rises from the dead. James changes his tune real quick. Rising from the dead will do that, I suppose. But people were telling James that. Yeah, James, I believe in God. I'm good. 
James goes, yeah, you know who else believes in God? The demons. And they shudder. You say you believe in God, but you don't even, you don't even have the respect to shudder. You don't even do as much as the demons do. So don't tell me you believe in God. It's not enough. This disconnected, powerless belief in God, it won't save you. That's not what Scripture teaches at all. It's trusting Jesus with your salvation. It's confessing your sins to Him. It's making Him the guiding principle and treasure of your life as you attempt to live out His commandments. That is what accepting Jesus looks like. That is what believing Jesus looks like. And of course, none of us are going to be perfect. I've done nothing but talk about how short I fall up here. And that's why Jesus' baptism is so much better than John's. Because John's baptism didn't save anybody. He goes out there and he's preaching and they're doing this whole thing and not a single person was saved. It prepared them for the real thing, but it didn't save anybody. Because see, Jesus doesn't just baptize with water. He baptizes, John says, with the Holy Spirit and fire. That means the Holy Spirit is around us. It lives inside us. It empowers us to live godly lives. It guides us into all truth. When we sit down for ourselves and we open the Bible, it helps us take it into our head and our heart. When I'm up here having studied and faithfully trying to proclaim what this book says, it acts not just in me, but in you as you hear it, and it helps that word take root. It helps us do what God has called us to do. And so it's not just we're powerless, we're just trying to hold up to the standard and we can't do it, and so we just fall short. He gives us the Holy Spirit to help us do that. But then he also does the purifying. So it says he baptizes with fire. So if he's purifying by fire, this is what baptism is, it's purification. It's, it's how you purify precious metals, right? You heat them, and then the impurities rise to the top. You skin them off. You're left with the good stuff. You burn away the bad. You're left with the pure. And what Jesus does is that he grants us this purity that we can't attain on our own, that we can't get there, that I try, and because I love him, I try to do what he says, because I respect and honor what he has done for me, I try to live up to his standard, but I'm going to fail, but he's the one doing the purifying. He's the one that when God looks at me, he doesn't see my righteousness, he sees Jesus's. It's the gift that He gives us in salvation. When He lives a sinless life, when He dies on the cross, when He rises from the dead, He gives us the purity that we can't get on our own, that John can't scare into us, that we can't do for ourselves. That doesn't mean that we don't live for Him doesn't mean that oh, I believe in Jesus and now I'll go do whatever I want. It doesn't work that way. It's repent. And what does that mean? Two things. Change your mind. Change your life. Let's pray. Lord, I thank You for this unbelievable gift that you have given us. This grace, this mercy, this righteousness that I could never attain on my own. That I come nowhere close to. Thank you that you have paid it all. You picked up the tab. You stood in my place. Lord, help us to receive this message and to not just hear it, 
but to believe it. And to not just believe it, but to act on it. That it wouldn't just come in our ears and stay in our heads, Lord, but that your gospel would work its way into our hearts and into our lives. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.